right, all right. Hey, come on, clap your hands if you're happy to be in church today. Woo! I'll tell you what, it's one of the first uh, Sundays in a really long time that I haven't been uh, up on the stage, like, you know, right about back here doing a little motion like this, but I got to sit in the front row today and just experience and just pour out my heart in worship, and I got to tell you, I'm jealous of you guys every week, getting be able to just lift my hands and just let that, let that happen to me like that and just pour out my heart before him. That was just amazing. I am so excited to bring God's word to you today. Come on, let's give God some praise one more time. He's good. He is good. So before I go any further, my name is Pastor Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this awesome fun and loving group of people called Lifeline Church. If you are new here today, I want to tell you something. If you're new here today, maybe it was a friend who invited you, maybe it was something on Facebook you saw, but let me tell you what's truth, is that God has been ushering you. God has been, has been drawing you. It's, it's the Father himself who's been, who's been desperate to have you back in his family, and he's the one who's been drawing you close to be here. You know why? Because he has a message of hope, encouragement, and love that he wants to speak into your life today. If you believe that with me, say amen. amen. I never mind when people say amen while I'm talking, just so you know. So before we go any further, um, I got a lot of little, little tiny things I, I like to do, um, but there is something that uh, we were doing last week. It's called a, a little fireworks booth. Maybe you heard of like yeah. Fourth of July fireworks booth. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, easy, easy, all right, I know it was a lot of fun and all, but we had this little arrangement going on where we had the fireworks booth, and last year um, we did 55000 in gross sales, and we did something like $20,000 in net uh, proceeds that all go to benefit the Lifeline Recovery Center. It's going to be amazing. So this year, um, the deal was, so we had an awesome crew of people running the fireworks booth, and I told them, hey... If instead of 20000 if you guys bring in 30000 of net proceeds that go, to the, that go to the recovery center, I will let you shave my beard. So the jury's still out on that, y'all. We don't know whether it's going to be, whether the, the numbers are going to be there or not. We're not exactly sure. We're not exactly sure or not. Um, you know what? But I'm going to need some accountability, you know, when we're tallying up all the numbers. I'm going to need an accountability partner for that. I'm going to be like, oh, 29.9. Sorry. Sorry. Y'all, y'all don't, you all don't really want that. That's what I'm just trying to tell you. You don't want, you don't want to see what's back there. It's all white. Hasn't seen the light of day in years. Nick, you went from having a 30-year-old pastor to having a 19-year-old pastor. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. So don't, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be honest, and here in a, around the end of the month, when all the numbers, you know, we have to wait for Phantom to get back to us. But believe me, um, when, it, when it happens, you'll, you'll know it. You'll know um, what the number was, whether, I, whether I'm still looking manly like I am today or whether, you know, I don't even want to talk about that. Okay. Oh, I tell you what. So I also want to take just a moment to look straight into that camera back there and say hello to everyone who's joining us online. I know every single week we have many people that join us online, and I want to, I want to speak directly to you, and I want to tell you I, I'm really glad you're here. And you may feel like you're not ready to come into a church building yet, or maybe um, your work schedule is preventing you from being here, but I want to tell you that you are a valued member of this community. And so that's why I'm looking straight into the camera right now, and I'm letting you know that I value you, we value you, and if you need anything, go ahead and, and comment there. And our, our team, who has been set up to, to help you and to be there for you, I just want to let you know that we, we love you, everyone watching online. Come on, say to, hello to your online family one time. Come on. <laughs> That's an important thing. We're going through the, one of the biggest communication shifts we've seen in the last 500 years. It would be foolish for us to ignore that, and I, I refuse to do so. I refuse to ignore that fact. Um, there are people listening online who just can't be here or want to be here who are scared maybe to be here, and so they're watching in their living rooms right now, and we love you. So go ahead and get your notes out. Get your, um, the bulletin out. If you've got your Bible with you, go ahead and bust that thing out. I don't have a big main scripture to share with you, but I am going to tell you we're going to cover a lot of ground today. Um, so you can also get on your iPhone or you can get on your superior Android device. 
Everybody loves Android in here. All right, no, that's cool. That's cool. I didn't get any booze this service. That's cool. That's cool. And you can find us on the YouVersion Bible app, and you can find uh, Lifeline Church in the YouVersion Bible app, and you can follow along with all the notes, and you can follow along all the scriptures to make it really easy to jump in. This series that we're in is called Unchained, as it says on the screens, Unchained. This, this message series that we're in is about the Word of God, and it goes a little something like this. When we know God's Word, and put it into practice. I'm going to say it again. When we know God's word and when we put it into practice, there is no chain that can bind us. There is no chain that can bind us. Paul said it like this. And because I preach this good news, I'm suffering and have been chained like a criminal. Look, my circumstances say one thing. My death in the family said one thing. My, my, my spouse who doesn't believe with me says another thing. My friends and my family, my coworkers, they are all coming against me, and it looks like my life is kind of chained up. It looks like things aren't going so well. My health says things aren't going so well. My finances say things aren't going so well. But the word of God cannot be chained, it goes on to say. Paul is saying this, I may be in prison because of my faith, but I have aligned my heart to what God says, not my circumstances, not my feelings, so there is no chain that can bind me. Somebody say amen with me. Amen. I am f I'm in the building and I'm feeling like, yes, yes, I love it. So we're going to get started in today's message called Your Bible Proved True. Your Bible and this, this title is not just a title, it's a statement of fact. Your Bible has been proved true. Maybe I got some, some skeptics in the room today. And let me tell you something. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that you would bring yourself to a church on Sunday because you're just curious. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, I am thrilled that you're here. And if anybody looks at you sideways, you tell me. I'll let them know. That's not how we treat people around here. You can come into this church, tune in online, no matter what stage of your journey you're on. But if you're still not convinced that the Bible that you hold in your hand, the Bible that's in your phone, these 66 books of, our, of, the, of the canon of doctrine and scripture are true, then you want to listen up right now because I'm about to share something really powerful with you. It's a, it's a subject called apologetics. Some of you have heard of it. Some of you haven't. See, the first time I heard the word apologetics, I thought it meant, you know, to be apologetic to say sorry really nicely, apologetics, to say sorry really nicely, but really that's not quite it. Apologetics is the argument for the existence of God, the defense of God, and that's the context I want to share these truths with you in, is not to attack people. We see a lot of, mm, we see a lot of Christians attacking people. I see a lot of Christians attacking other Christians out there these days. I see a lot of Christians attacking non-believers out there. More so than I see non-believers attacking Christians. It's, it's silliness. It's absolutely silliness. So some of these truths that you're going to hear right now could be used as ammunition. Could be used as, check this out, you, you, you dumb agnostic or you dumb atheist. But I want to encourage you as your pastor, please don't do that. Please don't do that. More and more and more and more, whether you're a conservative or a liberal or wherever you stand on that spectrum, I see more and more memes that insult people groups than I have ever seen in my whole life. And I see Christians posting them. Like, comment, and share if you agree. Everybody who likes Obama is dumb. Or everybody who likes Trump is dumb. Like and share if you agree. Man, what are you thinking? Please as your pastor, please don't do that. It only serves to entrench people in their original position. That is not the way of Christ. And that is not the way Lifeline is going to behave itself. We are a lifeline, not a stop sign. Hey, you know, if I want to get out there and tell people how to live their lives before I even have a relationship with them, I don't think we'd have as many people here and be as successful as we've been. We are called to be a lifeline to this community, not a stop sign, a big red, hey, don't do this and don't do that. If you believe that, you're dumb. Please, please, please don't do that. And I'm, I'm not usually like this. I'm not usually confrontational. Everything, I like to, nice little cute tweetable here, a little encouraging word there. But I felt really strongly when I was getting ready for this message that I needed to say that. Amen. That, man, that is, that is so not, that is so not God's heart. It starts with relationship and then moves in to an area of, of sanctification. People start 
with relationship with Jesus. We love people until they ask us why. Oh, let me tell you why. But it starts with that love. So in the context of this whole message, uh, the, uh, the subject of apologetics and these truths, some of these things are going to be really profound. I really love this stuff. Um, I didn't create this material. And actually, I preached this message before. It's about 18 months ago. But I thought, man, this is so powerful. This is so strong. And we only had like one-third of the amount of people in this church anyways. So I might as well share it again because it's really powerful stuff. And I want you, when you're holding that, that Bible in your hand or when you're reading it on your phone, I want you to know that this Bible is trustworthy and true. This Bible, you can, you can believe it. You can believe what it's saying. You can believe it's not only right, but it's true. Let's start with this, Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, they'll never pass away. Heaven and earth, it's, it's, the earth changes, man. Haven't you seen it? I wake up in the morning, there's something different than there was the day before. Man, our world is constantly changing, going through shifts. Things are changing all the time, but his words, they always remain true. They always remain solid. Heaven and earth pass away, but my words, they'll never pass away. Today, I'm going to show you how true that is. Now, this word, this word, starting in your bulletin, this is the first little point, first little thing I want you to listen to. Your Bible, it is historically accurate. It is historically accurate. The Bible more and more every year, every decade, every century is being proven historically true. And it just continues to do so. Every, every it seems like every hundred years, there's another big old discovery that proves the Bible true. But listen to this in Psalm 30, 33 verse 4, for the word of the Lord is not only right, it's right and true. That's what the Bible says about itself. It's not just a book of principles although there are principles in there. It's not just a book of good ideas, even though there's great ideas in there. This book is true. I hear a lot of people, you know, it's got some good things to say, but, you know, I don't know about that whole whale business, and I don't know about how, that whole water business and how they parted the sea. I, you know, you can't really just believe everything it says, but it's got some good principles in there. That's not what the Bible says about itself. And so if you're going to believe it, you've got to believe it. And what it says is, it's not only right, the words of the Lord are right and they're true. To be historically accurate. Now, this is very fascinating to me. This is not a Christian study. These three proofs of historical accuracy, this is a secular method of determining historical accuracy. Here are the three tests. Eyewitness accounts, number one. The whole Bible was written by people who were there. Eyewitness accounts is the first secular proof of historical testimony, that it was written by eyewitness accounts. Not, you know, he said that she said that my, my nephew was there. No, it was written by people who were there who saw it. Number two, copied with extreme care. Copied with extreme care. So the documents are copied with extreme care. It just so happens that the Jewish people, the Israelites, are the most meticulous, detail-oriented people that has ever graced this planet. They've, they've actually got a, a little reputation for it. The Jews, they do. But when you're growing up a Jew in the nation of Israel, you are required to memorize the five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You got to memorize that stuff for your, you know, into adulthood. And not only that, when you keep on growing up, if you're going to actually be a rabbi and you're going to grow up in that, you got to memorize every single letter, every space, every book. In, in those first five books of the Bible, they're, they're set up by, by spaces and letters, and they know the exact number of letters and spaces in those, in those books. And they'll go through, when they're copying and making a new copy, they'll go through and they'll count every single letter. And they go and look to the middle letter. Let's say there's 67,000 letters in the book of Deuteronomy, and they'll know the middle letter is L. And they know every single, and there's 67,723, I'm just guessing, but if there's 722, they'll throw the whole thing out. They'll throw the whole thing out. So this whole idea of, oh, every time they come up with a new translation, every time they copy it, they leave something out or they add something in, it's just not true. It's been copied and with extreme care and precision, even more so than some of the history books we were raised with. Number three, archaeological confirmation. These are secular tests, not even biblical. So by secular standards, our Bible is holding up. Archaeological conf confirmation, excuse me. There are still finding things. There are still finding things. Just last century, in the 1900s, there's a people called the Hittites. 
in the Bible. You know, the, the Jebusites, the Parasites, the Hittites, you know, the, all the ites. You know, they, you put them all together, man, I can't even remember what all they are. All the ites for, for 1,900 years. You know, they're looking and they're like, man, there is no proof of the Hittite nation even existing. Where are they? Never found any documentation, never found any cities, never found any nothing. But in the early 1900s, they're digging around, boom, found the whole nation. All the documentation, all the cities, the Hittite nation was discovered, and this was just 100 years ago. They are finding things to this day that continue to archaeologically confirm that your Bible is true, the one that you're reading every day. It's being proven true in and out of time. So that's amazing, and I just love that. So that's number one. It's historically accurate. Number two is this. It is scientifically accurate. Now, this is my favorite. This is my favorite because I'm kind of a science buff. I love science. I wasn't very good in school. You know, I kind of barely squeaked by, and by the time I went into high school, I, I found a lot more fun things to do than study. Can I get a, we forgive you? <laughs> uh, you thought I was going to say amen, huh? Can I get a we forgive you for having a pastor with a past? Okay. So I was a science guy, though. I always loved the science. I loved the beakers and the fire and the tests and the, the numbers and the categories and how the whole case studies. I loved all of that. I loved that. So when I became a Christian as an adult, I didn't get turned off by what the Bible said. I actually, I actually really enjoyed what it, what, it, what it was talking about. I'm like, the, the whole universe was created with a big bang? Yeah, God said, let there be light, and bang, there it was. <laughs> bang, there it was. Science is not at odds with our faith. So you don't have to be a scientist or a Christian. Science, as it evolves and as our understanding of science evolves, it proves the Bible true. I'll show you. I'll show you right here. Science evolves, and if you don't believe that, just read a science book from like 20 years ago. That'll do it. Okay, that will prove it to you. But listen to what the word says right here in Psalm 148, verse 5 and 6. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord, for he issued his command. He issued his command, and it came into being. He set them into place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. What I like to say it like is this. Science is like the canvas on which God painted creation. Our scientific discovery is his common sense. He's like, it's like God says, of course I use molecules and atoms and stuff. How else would you expect I did it? <laughs> How else, what, why else would I put the earth so far away from the sun and then those rays and the ultraviolet and photosynthesis and all this? Duh. It's like it's common sense to him. When he said it, science was created just like anything else. All the, all the understanding. So you don't have to be a scientist or a mathematician or a Christian. You don't have to throw out science to become a Christian. It's because science is proving it. Listen to this. It's not exactly what the Bible says all the time, but sometimes it's what the Bible doesn't say in the era it was written. This is very fascinating because there, there was a belief system during the time that the Bible was written. And you would think if people like you and me were writing the Bible back then, we would include some of those common knowledge truths that, in, that were commonly understood at the time. Like until... 500 years ago, the earth was flat. You all know that, right? It wasn't very long ago that the earth was flat. I mean, everyone understood it. Everyone knew that. I mean, just look outside. It's flat. Oh, but wait a second. Look at all the, look at the water. It's like you could barely see. Come on, man. Quit it. Yeah, it's flat, man. Look. Just look around. There's nothing to lead me to believe. I, I put my phone right here. It doesn't slide, does it? Earth is flat. Got it. And so you got people like Columbus, you know, I need to go and, and sail across the ocean to see if I can reach India or whatever. But if they just would have read Isaiah to the Queen of England, he wouldn't have had to prove it because Isaiah 40, says this, God sits enthroned above the circle. That's where we get the Greek word for sphere. God sits enthroned above the sphere. If it just would have read Isaiah, you would have known it was round. But no, you had to go and lose a bunch of life and, you know, do a whole bunch of stuff. And now we're here. Thank God. I think I, I really do like America. I'm glad that we're here. Don't get me wrong. But you didn't need to find out that way. You could have just read your Bible that said, God sits enthroned above the sphere of the world. Now, that's fascinating because when that book was written, nobody thought it was round. Nobody. Wonder, wonder how that happened. Maybe Isaiah didn't write it. Maybe God told Isaiah what to say, and he put what was true. 
Are you following me? This stuff is powerful. If you just think about it, this stuff is very powerful. Many cultures believe, on the other hand, that the earth had to rest on things. Like the Greeks, you know, the Atlas picture, you know, he had to stand like this and he has to, you, you've seen this? Atlas shrugged, you know, I shrugged and the earth fell down because I'm holding it. It was a common belief that the earth had to be held up. So the Greeks thought that way, but, but get you some of this. Check this out. The Hindu culture believed that the earth sits on an elephant that sits on a turtle, that sits on a serpent, that swims through the sea. Now get you some of that, okay? Now that's some good stuff right there. That is, whew, tell you what. Now Egypt, Egypt, now I'm not, I'm not poking fun, I'm just saying, you know, this, is, this was common knowledge. This was common knowledge across the world. People thought the earth was flat and it had to rest on things. The Egypt thought it was five pillars, one on each corner and one in the middle, five pillars. You know, the funny thing about that is, now Egypt totally believed that. And Moses, who was raised an Egyptian, you heard of Moses. They, they put him in the little basket and he floated down the Nile, you know, and Pharaoh's daughter got him. Oh, a cute little baby. I'm going to keep him. And he was raised an Egyptian. He was raised Egyptian royalty. He was in Egypt's finest schools. He lived there for 40 years. And you know what he ended up doing? Writing the first five books of the Bible. How come none of those beliefs end up in the Bible? Maybe because he was hearing from God, not going with what was true at the time. Hey, there's a truth of the day, but like I said, heaven and earth will pass away. What we believe to be true today may or may not change, but what's written in this word stands true forever. That the, the word of God, the, 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 book, the earth is not held up. In fact, the oldest book in your Bible, the book of Job, says it like this in chapter 26, verse 7. He spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. Man, Job knew. How did Job know? Maybe God told him. That's how Job knowed. Okay? He wasn't going off of his own understanding. He was going off the truth of the word of God. Because that's amazing. That's the oldest book. And people all across the world believe that the world had to be held up. But somehow Job knew that it's, being, that it's just suspended in space with no telescopes, no science books, none of this other stuff. Let's move on to astrological science. Man, I got a ton of this stuff. I got a ton of this stuff. I, I could keep going all day, but I'm going to keep it short. Don't, don't worry about that. I could go all day. I'm not going to. Astrological science. People used to think that the stars could be counted. You ever heard of that? You ever heard of people counting the stars and they think they could do it? That was a long time ago. Around 150 B.C., there was a guy named Hipparchus. I won't try and make you spell his name because it's whack. But Hipparchus, in 150 B.C., counted all the stars, man. Impressive dude. There was 1,022 of them. <laughs> Nailed it. Got him. One, two, three, 1,022. Got it. Hipparchus, a smart guy. But then, 300 years later, 150 A.D., there was this guy named Ptolemy with a P, P-T, just whack names. I don't know where they got their, I don't know who printed their baby books, but they were blowing it. Ptolemy, 300 years later, who is still considered one of the smartest, most advanced astrological minds, even today. And 300 years later, he's like, oh, Hipparchus, you missed it, bro. You missed four of them. There's 1,026. Nailed it. 1,026. But if they only would have read their Bible... 2,600 years ago, that states this. The stars of the sky cannot be counted. They cannot be counted. Hey, somebody tell me when they found the last star or planet. I'll bet you it wasn't even a month ago. Six months tops. They keep on finding these things over and over and over again. The bigger our telescope gets, the more stars there are. You know what I'm saying? You can't count them all. If, we just would have read, if they just would have read their Bible, they would have known that they were wasting their time. I mean, they were doing something good, but they just couldn't do it. So let's talk about medical science for a second. Like I said, I got so much more of this. The Bible knows more than we do, way more. And I'm convinced that there's a whole bunch of stuff I haven't even got to that is continuing. The Bible will continue to prove itself true. Let's talk about medical science for just a second because this, this is really good. Hippocrates, you, maybe you've heard of Hippocrates. He came up with this medical practice called humoralism. It was the idea that humans are made up of four parts. You with me? 
Humans are made up of four parts, and it's a, it's a personality thing, but it's also a medical thing. Um, Hipparchus came up with this idea of, of humoralism that says you're made up of black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. Those are the four parts of you. And if you're sick, it's one of those things that's making you sick. So if you had a heart problem, they, they used to say, oh, well, you got bad blood. We got to cut you and get that bad blood out of you. This was right medical practice for thousands of years until more recently than you might think. Our first president, George Washington, died from bloodletting because they believed it was the bad blood inside of him that was making him sick. But now we know that there is almost never a reason to get blood out of you. If anything, we got to get more blood in you. It's called a transfusion. But if they would have just read the book of Leviticus that said, the life of the body is in the blood. Man, what are you think? Get the blood. we got to cut you. You feeling bad? Come on, let me cut you, man. I'm going to make you feel better right now. What the heck? For thousands of years, people are coming up with ideas. But if they just would have read, man, the, no, the life of the body is in the blood. No, we're never going to cut you so that you can start to feel better. No, that's never going to work. How about uh, the Black Plague? Anybody heard of the Black Plague? Killed a quarter of Europe. Like 25 million people died from that. Why? Because they had very little idea about contagions, airborne, passive germs that are, man, you could just uh, cough a little bit and someone way back there is going to be like, uh, getting my germs on your face. Of course, we know that now. It's like, cover your mouth, man. Don't even joke about that, man. Get, get, get you out of here, man. Go home for the day. We know all about it now, but back then, people didn't realize how important that was. If they just would have read their Bible, in the book of Leviticus, God told the people of Israel, the priest will quarantine a sick person for seven days. Because if you got some of that bad stuff, we need to get you away from other people. He didn't say why. He just said to do it. Just do it. Because God created all that. He knows. He knows what he's a doing. If we just would, would look at his word as being not just, oh, yeah, it's got some cool things, but that seems weird. You know, why would I do that? No. Now we all know. My daughter is at home right now because she has a fever, and I don't want to get your baby sick. So she's at home. We, we know that now, but back then we, they had no concept of that. So 25 million people died. The Bible is continuing we, as the medical sciences evolve, as, as archaeological discoveries are made, the Bible is continuing to be proved true. Listen to this, Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord, flawless. I love, it. I love the way it's They're flawless. There's nothing wrong about them. They are flawless, like silver, purified in the crucible, like gold refined seven times. Now, here's one. This is a really big one. It is prophetically accurate. No, next in your bulletin is prophetically accurate, uh, not pathetically accurate, prophetically accurate, like predicting the future. It's accurate. It's accurate. It would be a great risk, you would think. You would think that it would be a great risk to put a bunch of guesses in the Bible and hope they come true. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess all these things about how the Messiah is going to come, and, you know, probably they'll come true. No, you'd think it would be a great risk. But maybe all the prophecy, there's a thousand prophecies in your Bible, over a thousand. 300 of them are about Jesus, about the Messiah that was to come. And they were given over an 1100 year period. So it was lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, people were documenting these prophecies that God was telling people about. And they weren't just generic prophecies about Jesus. You know, like, oh, he's going to be awesome. You know, he's going to have, like, some flowing hair. You know, he's going to be really cool. It wasn't generic prophecies. It was specific prophecies. Like, he's going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. He's going to be born here. He's going to live here. He's going to flee to Egypt. They're going to throw dice for his clothes. Not one bone will be broken. They were specific. They were really dialed in. Now, there was, a, there, was a guy, um, there was a guy named Dr. Peter Stoner. Now, if you're going to fact check me on this, be careful about your Googling, okay? Dr. Peter Stoner, uh, he had 600 probability experts to get together. Now, probability, most of you probably know this, but just in case, probability is a study 
of, you know, if I got a bucket with 10 tennis balls in it and one of them's red and I reach down and I swirl it around, I'm not looking, and I pull out the one red one, the chances of that happening are one in 10, right? Everybody following me? Okay, like three of you are following me. That's all right. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. All right. Okay. Um, so they studied probability. They studied probability. 600 people, Dr. Peter Stoner, got this study together, and they wanted to come up with what are the chances? What are the chances that, that all these prophecies about Jesus just so happened to be about this one guy? Because Jesus fulfilled them all. What are the chances of that happening? This is, this is amazing. The chances of eight of the 300 prophecies coming to pass is this number up here. It's one in 10 to the 17th power. It's this many. So the chances of eight, not all 300, the chances of eight coming to pass is that number right there. You know, six zeros is a million, nine is a billion, 12 is a trillion. That doesn't have a name, I'm pretty sure. It is just a huge number. It probably doesn't mean much to you. It's just a humongous number. But let me tell you, let me show you a word picture of what, th what that number is. Silver dollars. So that many, 10 to the 17th power, silver dollars, is the amount of silver dollars it would take to cover the entire face of Texas two feet deep. Two feet deep. That's how big that number is. And one of them is red. And the chance that you're flying around on a helicopter, you know, you, you got somebody in Oklahoma, you blindfold them, okay, man, let's go, go ahead and drive around for an hour and just tell us when to stop. And you're on your helicopter and you're driving around for hours. Texas is pretty big. It would take you a long time to go all the way across it. So you're just cruising around for hours and then the guy blindfolded, all right, stop right here, digs down and pulls out the one red coin for eight of them to have just occurred by chance. It's impossible. It's impossible. There is no, they call that, when I was taking philosophy at Delta College, they call that a scientific, systematic impossibility. It's scientifically and mathematically, yeah, there is a one in brrr, many zeros. It'll never happen. It, that, would, that could never happen. Scientifically, it's an impossibility. You'd have to have more faith to believe that than just to believe that we've got a loving father who created the world. You'd have to have way more faith to believe that. Listen to this, 2 Peter chapter 1, for prophecy never had its origin in human will. That's the only way it really happened is because someone saw it. Someone saw what was going to happen. It's like me on my phone, you know, and I got a camera down the street, and I look at my son, I'm like, hey, the next three cars are going to be red, blue, and green. He's going to be like, no way. And then red, blue, and green. My son's like, wow. But I just saw it. I saw it. God saw how it was going to take place, and he said it, so it was never a chance at all. It's not about probability. It's about the fact that it was always true all along. It was always going to happen that way. Matthew 26, 56, but all this is happening to fulfill the words of the prophets being recorded in the scriptures. By the way, there are prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled, and if you think the chances are really high, you know, that it, all of just for Jesus and you're, you're believing that, that maybe it's not chance, that maybe these prophecies aren't just chance, but maybe they're real. There's some prophecies that are still out that we don't want to be on the wrong side of, that we don't want to be on the wrong side of. Revelation 22, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that will take place, that must take place. These things are not chance. We're not taking guesses here. This, this is really happening. So next one is this. It is thematically unified. So I need um, three people that have a bulletin and a pen. Go ahead. You just give me a little tiny wave. You don't have to make a show of yourself. I got one. I got two. And I got a third person with a pen and a bulletin. I'm not going to make you stand up or anything. Can I get? Oh, number three. Okay. What I want you three to do, what I want you three to do is I want you to write down what you believe is the best color. Just the best color. What you think the best color is. While you're doing that, I want to explain to you how the Bible is thematically unified. You would think that the Bible would be thematically unified if one person wrote it. That would be obvious. But the Bible wasn't written by one person. It was written by 40 people over 1,600 years in 12 different nations over three different continents. You know, it's pretty tough to get your story straight along those borders. It's pretty tough to line it up. 
But still, the Bible turns out to be thematically unified and about one thing. What's the best color? Gold, of course. What's the best color? Green, of course. What's the best color? Blue, of course. Man, we go to the same church and we still can't get our story straight about what the favorite color is. I was going to say green, but that's all right. We're in the same church in the same city. These people were over 12 different nations, three continents, over 1,600 years apart, and they still said, the best color is Jesus. The Old Testament was about Jesus. The New Testament about Jesus. The gospel is about Jesus. The whole thing is pointing to one event and that God sent his son to die for you. That's the theme, the whole Bible, front and back. You read Genesis, and you're like, dang, that sounds like a lot like what Jesus is doing. You read the law, man, that sounds a lot like what Jesus was talking about. You read the prophets, man, that sounds a lot like Jesus. You read the gospels, well, it's about Jesus. You read all the letters, they're pointing back to everything Jesus said. The whole thing is thematically unified, even though it was written over 1,600 years, and we couldn't even get our story straight in the same church, in the same city, Y'all were ladies, too. Y'all should have had the same color, right? No. It's pretty hard to get your story straight, but the Bible somehow, some way, is thematically unified. Over all that, there's no way. There's no other way is that it really did have just one author, God, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this last um, one more before the last one is it survived all attacks. It has survived all attacks. The next one in your bulletin. So let me ask, why do you think the Bible is attacked so much anyways? How come the Bible is so attacked all the time? It's just, it's baffling to me. Why so much scrutiny about Christianity? Why? It's like no other belief system. It's like no other book. The Bible to this day is the most despised, disputed, denied, outlawed, dissected, debated, and destroyed book that ever graced this planet, and it still endures. How do you figure that's true? And let me tell you something else. It will continue to endure no matter what happens in our country, no matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in your life. This word will remain true and remain passionate about your salvation. Excuse my passion, but this word is trustworthy. It's true. You can believe in it. You can stand on it. When you're reading it in the morning, you can say, man, this, this book is so inspired. And so for me today that nothing can ever stand in the way of it. I like the way 1 Peter 1 says it. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Ooh. Ooh. I love it so much. These values like never before are under attack. There was a French philosopher called Voltaire. Man, he was so cool. He only had one name. Voltaire. He just walks in the room, all French, Voltaire. He probably wore all black, just like this too, all authoritative, Voltaire. He would say, he would talk about himself in the first, Voltaire is here. Listen to what Voltaire has to say. He was greatly respected. He was a philosopher, and he, uh, he is quoted as saying, in 100 years, Christianity will be forgotten. And the only thing that's ever been forgotten is that quote. He, he passed away, and they print Bibles in his house now. True story. True story. The French Bible Society bought his house and print Bibles in his house, and he said, Christianity ain't nothing. In 100 years, it's going to be, you know, because cause whatever he said. But, you know, probably only a few you only knew who that dude was anyway. Smart people, man. Smart people. They'll continue to fly in the face, and they'll have arguments, and they'll say things that'll make you go, maybe he's right. Maybe they're right. You know, am I sure? I want you, I want you to walk out of this room sure that your Bible is true. Your Bible is trustworthy. This faith is not built on a house of cards. This, this Christianity that you're maybe even just thinking about, maybe you're just considering, maybe you still consider yourself on the fence a little bit, let me assure you. That this is not a house of cards that, you know, one little thing happens and it all falls down. For thousands of years, that, uh, science, astronomy, um, uh, the, um, all the discoveries they've made, nothing has been ever to able to shut it down. Nothing has been able to shut it down. This means that if we hear something we don't agree with or see something we don't agree with in this word, we can say to ourselves, let God's word be true and every man a liar. 
I'm going to choose to stand on my Bible. I'm, and I don't, mean, I don't mean stand on it. When we, say, when we say things like that, that might be a little Christianese. But when we say, I'm going to stand on my Bible, it means I'm going to choose to believe my Bible over my circumstances. I'm going to choose to believe what God says about me over what my mom and dad used to say about me. Or what my teacher used to say about me. I'm going to choose to believe what my father says about me instead of what my spouse says about me, what my, my friends, my so-called friends, what they say about me. I'm going to choose to believe God's word over anything else. Amen. Above my, my job troubles, above my financial troubles, above my emotional insecurities, above my stage fright, above everything else. I'm going to choose to believe that God has a plan and purpose for my life. I'm going to believe that over anything else. Amen. I'm going to choose to believe it. Let God be true. And every man a liar. And I stand here just like any of you. Let God be true. And I'm going to choose to believe him over anybody else. The last one is this. It has transforming power. Amen. Your Bible not only is trustworthy and true, but it has transforming power in your life. This is the only one that you put to the test. All these other ones were the historical test, the science test, the whatever. This is the one you get to do. You get to put the word to the test here. You get to put God to the test here. I know it says don't put God to the test except for money. You can put him to the test there. But your Bible, you can, you can put it to the test that it has transforming power in your life. How? Make a decision. Amen. Make a decision here and now to believe what the Bible says about you over what anyone else says about you. Above what that teacher said, above what that parent said, above what that aunt or uncle said about you that you can't seem to shake, let, let God's word be true in your life. It has transforming power. The way to walk that out is just, I would love for you to get involved. Do what we have to offer. I've heard other pastors say, give us a year. You know, do, what we, what, do the things that we're that we put out there, you know, the growth track, the life groups, getting baptized, doing the equipped classes. S taste and see. The Lord is good, but you got to taste. You're the one that has to go, yeah, yeah, this works for me. This is actually better than I thought it was. Taste and see that the Lord is good. This is the one that you can put on yourself. John 8 says it like this. John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus says this to all of us. He says it to you. If you hold to my teaching, my words, if you hold to my word, if you take that Bible and say, I'm going to hold, I'm going to hold, then you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me today. Because now's the time. Now's the time. I, I've laid out all the proof. I've laid out all the, you know, we've done all the study and I've, I've made a case for you. But I can never make the next step, the step that I'm going to ask you to take in a moment. I can never take that step for you. No one else in all of creation, no one else in your family, no one else in the world, no one else in your school, no one else at your job can ever take the next step, the one that I'm asking you to take. The step I'm asking you to take is to put him to the test and see that God's word has transforming power in your life. Maybe you've been struggling with some things. Maybe this world has been harsh on you. Maybe you're caught in a cycle of behavior that you know is destructive, but you just can't seem to break free. What I want to give to you is a way out, a new way of life, a new way of thinking, a new place to put your trust that it may look like I'm in chains, but I'm aligned to the word of God, so I am never chained. I want to speak to a group of people right now that maybe you used to have a relationship with God, but somewhere along the line, you, you walked away from it. You used to be tight. You used to read the Bible. You used to pray all the time. You used to go to church, but, but something happened, and, and now you're a little bit distant. Now it's been a long time since you've even talked with him. It's been even longer since you've been to church. What I want to do is I want to give you an opportunity, just like the prodigal son. The prodigal son, see, he, he thought that even though he used to be in the father's house, but he, he ran away. You know, he, he moved on. He thought this other life was going to be funner. But he had to come back. But he was all ashamed. But what the prodigal son didn't know is that the father was waiting outside. 
The father was waiting outside in the cold. The father hiked up his little outfit and went running. And the father comes running to you if you would just turn your face back to him and say, Father, I want to come home. I want to come home. I want to give you an opportunity right now with no shame, no condemnation to come back to God. I want to make another offer. Maybe you've never had a relationship with God. Maybe you've never made that decision. Maybe you've never even heard the love of God talked about this way before. This is the first time you're hearing about it. And if that's you, I, I envy you. <laughs> because this, this is one of the most exciting days of your life. The day where you get to decide, I'm, I'm changing everything. I'm not going to do things the old way anymore. I'm not going to be the old me anymore. It's lost its flavor. What I heard today, that's what I want. A life with God, that's what I want. A life with Jesus, that's what I want. And if that's you in just a moment, I'm gonna give you this opportunity. So everyone in the room, if, if that's what you want, a relationship with a father who loves you, a heavenly father who is like no other father, like Pastor Amber was talking about, it's not like the love that we see in this world. It's not like the love we see on TV, okay? It's not sensual, it's not contractual, it's not transactional. If you do this, I'm gonna love you. No, his love is reckless for you. His love runs after you, chases you down, pursues you, even if you're not looking for it. If that's what you want, that kind of love, that kind of relationship with God, I'd love for you to shoot your hand up in the sky right now. Go ahead, lift it up high, amen. Sisters, I see you. One, two, three. Brother, I see you. Sister, one. These two brothers right here. I see hands all over this room that are giving their lives to Jesus. Come on, can we clap our hands? This is the best day of your life. This is the best day of your life. And I envy you because you're meeting your Father in heaven who loves you so much. And he doesn't make it hard to come to him. This is what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer together. And if you, can, if you can believe these words as I say them, I want you to repeat them as if they're your own. I'm going to help you along. Let's say this together. Father God, I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins and make me new. Thank you for your love and thank you for the sacrifice that your son Jesus paid on the cross. Make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I give you everything. Amen. Can we clap our hands for those who gave their lives to Jesus today?